Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. We good? I can see over the mic, so we're good. Uh, my name's Kathy, and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm always nervous when I do this. But I think that if I didn't get nervous, then I probably shouldn't be doing this. Because to me, then ego's taken over. But um, I said a little prayer to myself earlier today, and I said, uh, your will, not mine. Speak from the heart and tell the truth. Why would anybody have to tell themselves to tell the truth? <laughs> Because I'm an alcoholic and I like to lie, and we'll talk about that. Um, so, um, been in San Diego for quite a while, but I was born in Midland, Michigan. Uh, my dad was an alcoholic. Uh, I'm number eight of ten kids, small Catholic family. Um, yeah. And uh, most of us are alcoholics, but I'm the only one that has a program and is in recovery, which is pretty crazy. Um, anyways, I, at a very young age, started drinking because I didn't feel like I fit in, thought I was fat, thought I was ugly, thought I was stupid, you know, all of that alcoholic talk. And um, so I started running away from home and doing whatever I wanted to do because it was my will and not my parents. Um, so, and my parents moved around a lot. My dad was a salesman. And uh, so when I was 16, I left home and I went to work and live at this pig farm. And it was the perfect place for me uh, because the pig farmers were, at the time, they were old. They were in their late 30s. Um, <laughs> I was 16. Um, and by the way, uh, my sobriety date is uh, March 26th, um, 1988. And that is a miracle. I like to tell people I got sober when I was 12, but um, the, tr <laughs> the truth is I got sober when I was 28, and I've been sober 29 years, and that's a freaking miracle. Um, anyway, so I go to this pig farm to work and finish high school, and the pig farmers uh, party a lot. They smoke a lot of dope. They drink, um, and I was always a good worker because I had to prove to people that I wasn't this screwed up um, alcoholic. So I was always a hard worker. So I went to the pig farm, uh, graduated from high school somehow, didn't really make a lot of friends there. Um, I used to go to school smelling like pig shit, um, just so people wouldn't talk to me. And that worked. Um, when I graduated from high school, I was so stoned on the way there, I barely remember my graduation. But, you know, I had high aspirations. I started working at a bar um, there in, in Elsie, Michigan, it was called Hoover's Corner. And, uh, it's, it, it was just like it sounds, you know, they used to pull the tractors up and, you know, bikers would pull up and drink beer and drink Jack Daniels. And I was supposed to be working in the kitchen, but when the bar closed, we would all sit at the bar and drink shots of Jack Daniels. And at this time I was 18 and, uh, I remember getting sitting there drinking shots of Jack Daniels, and the next thing I remember is getting on the back of a motorcycle with some guy that I don't know. Um, and then the next thing I remember was waking up in my car in the ditch, and I had puked on the front of myself and pissed my pants. That was at 18, and I drank for another 10 years. <laughs> um, whenever I drank, it was either pass out, get kicked out of somewhere. I mean, I never, never remember just having one drink, ever. You know, I would take a drink of alcohol and something, I just got this rush. I th think it's kind of like maybe when people shoot up and they talk about that rush. I would get this rush, and, um, and I didn't want to stop drinking. Something clicked in my brain, and I just couldn't stop until, you know, the alcohol was gone or I was in trouble or somewhere where I wasn't supposed to be, which um, I did a lot of dangerous things when I was drinking. You know, alcohol made me feel like I was bigger and badder than everybody. Um, 
Anyways, I, when I uh, ended up in the ditch, I walked into town, looking the way I looked, got a tow truck, got my car out of the ditch, this car that my the pig farmers had bought for me as a graduation present, a 68 Rambler, <laughs> and had an 8-track eight eight uh, tape deck in it. Um, and I, I charged the towing bill to them, and then I wrote a note about how they were screwing up my life. And they were trying to control me. And, you know, all my life it was everybody else when I was drinking. Always pointing my finger at everybody else. And I threw what clothes I had in the car and I went back to my hometown. And it wasn't long before people got tired of me mooching off of them, my family, my sisters. Um, I had flat tires in the car. And so um, I stumbled into a Navy recruiting office and um, and joined the Navy. Um, and, you know, I'll fast forward a little bit. I retired from the Navy in 2010 um, with 30 years, only because of this program. And uh, I retired as a command master chief. And, and when you hear the rest of my story, it's a big deal. Uh, so I stumbled into the recruiting office. My first duty station was Bermuda. And... Um, yeah, it was, I'd, I'd like to tell you it was beautiful and it was wonderful, but I don't really remember a whole lot of it. Um, they had some really good black seal, this Bermudian rum, and I spent most of that two years in a blackout, and um, yeah, I went to Captain's Mass four times. Captain's Mass is like court in the civilian world, and one of the times I went, I would go for disrespect and being um, UA, unauthorized absence, um, disobeying lawful orders, but one time I was standing in front of the captain and um, he said, if you, Fireman Hanson, if you apologize to whoever it was, he said, I'm going to dismiss this. And this arrogant, uh, at the time, maybe 19-year-old said, fuck him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, that didn't go over well with the captain. So I did a lot of extra duty and I don't know how I didn't get kicked out of the Navy, but um, one night I was partying in town with a bunch of friends, the drinking, uh, drinking age was 18 of Bermuda. And this guy that I didn't know asked me to go for a walk. And, you know, I thought he was with my friends. I thought someone knew him, you know, and this is where I tell you, I always constantly put myself in dangerous situations. And, um, so I walk, go for a walk with this guy and I end up being, um, raped and beat up. And, you know, this guy had just gotten out of prison for almost killing a, like a 60 year old woman and raping her. So I don't know how I, um, made it back to the bar. Uh, my shirt was ripped and I, you know, was bloody and, um, went back to the base and, um, somehow my friends talked me into going to the police and I did. And, and that guy got seven to 10 years and, um, that was brave, but that wasn't me. That was my friends pushing. But what I did was I took that situation, and I did this a lot in my drinking. I would take a really terrible situation, and I would embellish and make it worse because I wanted people to feel sorry for me so that I could drink. Um, so um, my family, I quit calling them um, after the sexual assault, and um, and then one day I talked to them and I, and I made up this lie, um, to them about this, the sexual assault. And, and, uh, um, I had told them that, um, that I got pregnant and had to have an abortion and that wasn't true. And then eventually I had to make amends for that. But why this alcoholic takes a terrible situation and makes it worse? Um, I don't know. I don't know why, but, uh, anyways, I transferred from, uh, Bermuda, and I went to, I came to San Diego, California, and, um, and I used to drink up and down El Cajon Boulevard, um, University Avenue, just, um, in a blackout. How I never got hurt or anything happened there, I don't know. Um, but, uh, I was taking my friends to the ship one day. I was on a ship here at 32nd Street, and, I had this wicked hangover and, um, and I dropped them off and I just drove off and I went UA. I went AWOL. 
and I got to my house and I hid and I thought, oh my God, you know, they're going to come arrest me. And after about a week, I was scared. So I turned myself in and the Navy flew me up to San Francisco, which was where the ship, and we were on our way to Ever Washington. And I, uh, one more time I go to Captain's Mast and I started crying and telling them that, uh, you know, my parents are going to meet the ship in Washington and I'm having problems in my relationship. You know, I did what every good alcoholic does. I lied. Um, and uh, the captain felt sorry for me and he didn't restrict me to the ship. He did tell me that if I got in trouble again, that I would lose um, what rank I had. And I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> so I got to leave. I hung out with my parents for a couple of days and then my parents left and we had to be back to the ship at midnight. Well, at midnight, I was so wasted that I talked to a friend of mine in going UA again. It's not good to miss ship's movement. Um, and so we, we went UA and, um, we were going to hitchhike from Everett, Washington back to San Diego and we made it to Tacoma, um, <laughs> which is not very far, but, um, I said, the funny part is I, it took me a long time of being sober before I realized how close those cities were together. But, um, talking about the fog, you know, um, Anyway, so we start hitchhiking and we get to Tacoma and I call uh, my friends and they send us bus tickets. So we jump on a Greyhound bus and we make it to San Francisco and I'm like, man, I really didn't get a chance to party in San Francisco. So we traded in those bus tickets to, to party in San Francisco. Uh, and that's what we did for a week. We'd meet someone at a bar and hang out with them and you, you know the rest of the story. But uh, we had to call our friends back. And they sent us non-refundable bus tickets. And, um, so we got back to San Diego. Um, she turned herself in after 28 days, which is, you know, anything past 28 days and you're considered a deserter. Um, and about the time that I was past 30 days, not sober, but a deserter, um, my brother, one of my brothers called me and he had battled with depression and, um, alcoholism, and um, and I told him, come to San Diego, I'll help you. <laughs> I'm a deserter from the Navy, I'm a drunk, but come to San Diego and I'll help you. And um, after a couple months in San Diego, uh, him and I got in a fight. You know, he, uh, he just wanted to lay on the couch all day and drink beer, and I was working a couple jobs with a fake social security number because I didn't want to get caught being a deserter. And... Um, and we got in an argument, and he said he was going to kill himself. And I was drunk and selfish, and I said, why don't you do that? And that's what he did. Um, so, yeah, my brother jumped off the Coronado Bridge, and he didn't have any identification on him. And um, so a friend of mine brings the newspaper to me, and it says, police look for help to identify a man that jumped to his death from the Coronado Bridge. And um, and I read it and I said, so what? And she said, I think it's your brother. And I was like, no way, you know, he's not that tall, whatever. Um, but she went and identified his body and I was my brother. And so I had to deal with all of that. And for many, many years, um, I blamed myself for that. Um, but, um, but just like the sexual assault, I had to take that story and I had to make it worse so that I could sit on a bar stool and drink and people would feel sorry for me and buy me drinks. And so I don't know why, but I started telling the story about my brother killing himself and that I had to identify his body and I didn't, you know? Um, so, um, I left, oh, so I went, I moved up to Spokane, Washington to watch my parents' house. I had been a deserter for 14 months. And I moved up to Washington to watch my parents' house, and they said, are you out of the Navy? And I was like, kind of. Um, <laughs> but I um, <laughs> I was in a bar, drunk, running my mouth about being a deserter, and I got arrested, arrested the next morning in front of my parents' house um, up in Washington, and all the neighbors were out there, and they cuffed me and threw me in the car, and that was the first time I had really ever been to jail, um, Spokane County Jail, for two weeks. And the Navy came and got me, and they flew me back to San Diego as a prisoner. 
Uh, five shore patrol escorted me out of the San Diego airport in handcuffs. Um, I probably weighed a hundred pounds at that time. So I didn't, wasn't, didn't have much of an appetite in jail. Um, but when we got back to San Diego, I thought, well, they'll just restrict me to the base, uh, because there's not a women's brig here. And they sent me to the federal penitentiary downtown San Diego. And this, you know, pig farmer punk from Michigan, um, I was scared. I was scared. I spent two weeks in, this, in the federal penitentiary. I was the only one that did their job. They'd tell me to do something. I was going to do it. I would mop and sweep. I was one of those people, Charlene. Um, so two weeks, the magistrate came and asked me if I was going to run, and I said no. And um, so I got put at 32nd Street, and I had to go through a special court martial. And at this time, um, you know, they they got someone to help me. You know, I got a counselor to talk to about the sexual assault. I got, you know, to talk to somebody about my brother. but. You know, I didn't get sober then. I went to a special court martial, and they offered me a bad conduct discharge or finish my time. And I just decided I would finish my time. And this, this is unheard of, you know. Only in the early 80s would this happen, because today you wouldn't be able to do this. But um, So after 15 months of being a deserter, they sent me to security at Miramar, California. Um, and I, I didn't get sober then. What I learned was to drink with my bosses now. Because if I drink with my boss and we're wasted in the middle of the night and nobody really remembers anything and I don't show up for work the next day, well, I was with my boss. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, so I, I made, I had gotten busted from an E5 down to an E3. Um, in two years, I made E5 back. Um, you know, I told you I'm a hard worker. I made E5 back. I re-enlisted for $20,000, and I transferred from San Diego to St. Mary's, Georgia. And I wasted every bit of that money driving across country. Everybody along the way had a good time. Um, drinking and doing drugs. And then when I got to St. Mary's, Georgia was when I got sober. And so... Um, you know, this is the way the program works, right? I grew up going to Alateine, um, but never really paid attention. And my father was in the program for a short amount of time. He died sober, but um, he was just a dry drunk. He quit coming to meetings because people talked about drugs, and they were still only putting a dollar in the basket. I said, okay, Dad. Um, <laughs> that's a resentment coming to happen. Um, but um, so <laughs> I forgot where I was making fun of my dad. Um, just got sober in Georgia. So the last time I drank, I met a woman that was in the program, and I didn't know that she was in the program, and we uh, compared stories, right? She would, she would tell a drunk story, and I would laugh about it, and then I would tell a drunk story. And um, the truth is I got 13 step into the program. But I'm just stand up here and be honest. There is no such thing for the newcomers as a 13 step, but um, anyway, she had seven years sober, and um, you know, I started to think maybe I am an alcoholic because we were laughing at the same stories. Uh, but the last night that she had liberty, um, she was going to go to a meeting, and I was like, cool, I'll go to this little tiki bar over here, and I'll have one rum and coke. Yeah, never had one rum and coke in my whole life. Um, but she said, no, come to the meeting. And so I did. I went to the meeting with her, and I'll never forget. Um, I think we were uh, we were in either the Bahamas or the Virgin Islands. I can't remember now. But um, it was on the 10th step, and I said, I'm Kathy, and I'm here to support my friend. And um, I shared about the 10th step, what we had read. And they said, keep coming back. Um, didn't know what that meant at the time. Um, but, you know, I got back to, um, well, she had duty the last day. And when I left the ship, I swear, I don't know how I knew this, but I knew it was going to be the last time that I drank. And I bought a fifth of rum and I went up in the hills and I was drinking with some island people that I didn't know, put myself in danger again. I remember being in a bar with a bunch of sailors and my head was down on the table, passed out. And then I would get up and dance. Yeah. Clear the dance floor, probably more like it. Um, I'm not a big dancer. But, uh, and then I guess Shore Patrol brought me back to the ship. 
and um, I lived in a birthing compartment with 150 other women, and it had a lounge attached to the birthing compartment, and they had these, you know, plastic chairs in there. And I woke up the next morning, and the ship was already underway, and I was sitting in the lounge in my birthing compartment with no clothes on, and I had puked and pissed down the front of myself. And that was my 10 years of drinking, and there was lots of, um, lots of drunks in between there that um, you can only imagine what happened. But um, the ship got back to St. Mary's, Georgia, and my roommate picked me up. And normally we would go straight to the liquor store because I've been underway for eight days. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and she started heading towards the liquor store, and I started crying, and I said, um, I said, I think I'm an alcoholic. And she said, no shit. <laughs> yeah. Everybody in my life knew. You know, my bosses knew, and they probably weren't that far behind catching me. Um, I didn't feel like um, I could go to treatment. I didn't feel like I could be honest because I was gay, and I was don't ask, don't tell. So I'm still gay. Not I was. I'm still. Anyways. Um, <laughs> So I didn't go to treatment. I just started going to meetings there in St. Mary's, Georgia. And um, it, was a, it was a rough place to drink, and it was a rough place to get sober. This was um, at a time when they told you, take the cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth or shut the F up. Or um, One of the first meetings I went to, uh, there was everybody was sharing about every horrible thing that had happened to them and lost houses and cars and money and and I shared you know I haven't really lost those things yet and one old guy in the back of the room said why don't you go out and drink some more and of course you know I cried why would he talk to me that way um but do you know I stayed sober my first year because of that asshole you know I was going to prove to him and I think he knew that his name was Lloyd um but I got a sponsor right away um I just knew that I was sick and tired of living the way I was living. Um, sick and tired of not remembering what I did, kind of maybe remembering who, I, I don't know. Um, just so, so sick and tired of feeling the way I was feeling. Um, that I started going to meetings just about every day. And I got a sponsor right away. And I didn't really, so... Um, Admitting I was powerless over alcohol, I knew that. I knew that whenever I took a sip of alcohol, I was powerless. I didn't really understand how unmanageable my life was. Deserter in the Navy, you know, going backwards in rank instead of forward. Um, but really because I had caretakers, right? I had a partner that was taking care of me. The Navy was taking care of me. Um, so I didn't realize how unmanageable my life was until I was in the program for a while. I had a hard time with step two because I grew up Catholic and I still am not sure, you know, I don't, I, I normally call my higher power God or, but I don't know what I believe. Um, I believe in something because it's definitely bigger than me because I couldn't stay sober on my own. Um, I call it a spirit, um, the earth, AA. Um, but anyways, my sponsor told me, I said, I don't, you know, I don't know about that step two. Um, because when I grew up Catholic and I had to go to my, um, first communion, no, not first communion, the, what is it? Bless me, father. I have, uh, <laughs> confession. Thank you. It's group effort. <laughs> had to go to confession when I was seven for the first time. And I lied at confession because I didn't know what to say. So I knew I was going to hell. I mean, I lied and said I had stole something. Um, so I didn't know. And, and, you know, being gay and Catholic and, oh, I just knew I was going to hell. It was always all this fear-based um, God. Um, so my sponsor just told me to get on my knees and act as if. And so that's what I did. You know, I just started praying to whatever. And I still do it now. I, um, I joke now and say that, you know, my mom passed away a few years ago. And I, um, her name was Alice. So sometimes I call my higher power Alice. Uh, but. Um, and then to do God's will instead of my will, you know, it, it's a daily thing, right? I can, 
in the morning, be really serene, having a cup of coffee, haven't really talked to anybody, and then, you know, get on the road and all hell breaks loose. Um, and I have to give my will back because um, I take it back often. Um, but the fourth step, really, I mean, I've and I've done, I don't know, five or six fourth steps, and they all um, were different, and they all changed my life in different ways. And I know for this alcoholic, had I not, my first four step was at six months sober. And I couldn't understand the book yet. It was all too, just too much to comprehend, let alone read. Um, so she said, just write down everything you can think of that you feel really um, remorseful about or that bothers you. And so that's what I did. I started from as far back as I could remember, and I just wrote this all about my life and the things that I had felt bad about. And I, you know, I wrote down those lies that I had told about the sexual assault and my brother, and um, there was a couple other lies, and I can't remember what they are now, and that's good. But um, I wrote them down, and then when I shared them with her, I didn't have to keep telling those lies anymore, you know, because now I had shared it with somebody. As embarrassing as it was, I could share it with somebody and, and be done with it. I didn't really, from that four step, I didn't get a list of character defects. I didn't get um, a list of people I had harmed. But uh, shortly after, um, at three years sober, I got a call from the detailers in Washington, D.C., and they're the people that tell you where you're going to be stationed next. And uh, they called and said, how'd you like to be a detailer? And I was actually thinking about getting out of the Navy. Um, and I was like, sure. you know." So I moved up to Washington, D.C., and um, and I got another sponsor up there. They called her the Step Nazi, and I was scared to death of her. But she was exactly what I needed. You know, she I needed someone that the first thing she said to me was, if you're not willing to do what I suggest to you, then this isn't going to work, you know. So right off the get-go, um, she's going to fire me before we even got started. But um, but she walked me through steps one, two, and three again because I needed to understand them more. And we read them in the big book, and we read them in the 12 and 12. And then she had me do um, a four-step that was called the California four-step. And it was uh, all the stages in your life, childhood, adolescence, adulthood. And you had to answer all these questions and write just forever. And a lot of the questions repeated themselves. And I didn't realize until I, you know, was going to do that fifth step with my uh, sponsor that, you know, those different stages in my life showed me the patterns in my life. And those patterns in my life were my character defects, were the things that I kept doing over and over and over. And I actually ended up with a list of people that I had harmed. Um, you know, it all happens for a reason. The, the steps are in order for a reason. Um, because right after I got sober, if I would have gone to my parents and said, oh, you know, tried to make amends, they'd be like, yeah, right, Kathy. And many of my friends, you know, because a lot of times I told them, you know, that I was going to quit drinking, but, um, but I never stuck to it. So um, that four step, um, Pushed or that fourth and fifth, and and getting those really good lists was really helpful. But I was leaving my sponsor's house after doing that fifth step with her, and she said, um, "Call me tomorrow. Read step six, and delay is deadly." And I was like, "Or damn, I think that's what it says." And I didn't know what she was talking about, but I felt so good and so relieved after that fourth and fifth. I was not going to read that sixth step. So she called me the next day, and this was rare because she was, you know, one of those sponsors that believes that the sponsee, they called us pigeons, um, that we were supposed to call them. And she said that statement, delay is deadly, and I didn't know what she was talking about. So she knew that I hadn't read it. And she, you know, she got on me. She's like, did you lose your willingness? You know, I told you if you're not going to do what's suggested. Um, and so, you know. I went, I promptly went and got my book and read it. Um, and then when I, you know, I didn't understand it. It took a long time before I understood um, because those character defects in a lot of times kept me alive. You know, they kept me alive when I was drunk and out there doing stupid things. But 
the good Catholic girl decided when I was ready to do step seven, I was going to New, up to New York City and I was going to um, go to St. Patrick's Cathedral and I was going to light a candle and I was going to ask for my character defects to be removed and poof. Yeah. Yeah. No, not so much. Um, just like all the other steps, um, I have to work them every day. Um, and my character defects are less. I still have some of them, you know, controlling, you know, I want to control the whole world. And, um, and a lot of times, you know, one of the promises that works in my life is I might think it up here, but if it doesn't come out here, it's a really good day. Um, because people don't need to know, but they'd be better off not knowing what's up here. But, um, when I started making those amends, um, some of them, like my father, um, I never really liked my father. You know, I would run away a lot. We just, he told me one time, women and gays were ruining the military. And I was like, mm -hmm. strike two for me. <laughs> um, he was, yeah, he was just crazy. He was uh, racist. He was, uh, didn't believe in paying taxes. He was crazy. Uh, but when I wrote that first four step to him, I did a lot of pointing my finger at him like I had done to everyone in the Navy when I had gotten in trouble. And I took it to my sponsor and I was so proud of that four step. And she said, well, that's good, Kathy. What's your part in it? And I was like, man. So I really, you know, what my dad's part in it was none of my business. What I had to do was clean up my side of the street. And I made him worry when I ran away and I was disrespectful. And so I had to rewrite it and make amends for the things that I had done. You know, he did the best he could do. Um, I had to make amends. Um, my sponsor said, you know, my brother, David, who had committed suicide was on that list. And you know, how am I going to make amends to him? And, uh, you know, I wrote a letter and read it at his grave, but, um, at seven years sober, I came out to, I was stationed in DC. I came out to California with my mom for Christmas, um, with my youngest brother. He lived here. And, um, <clears throat> and when we got here, he, um, uh, told me that he had AIDS and that he had, um, 90 to a hundred days to live. And he asked if I would stay and take care of him. Would I stay and help? You know, so I'm a welder in the Navy. I don't really know anything about being a nurse, but what this program taught me is to not question that and to let him die with dignity the way he wanted to die. Um, my family wanted him to try all these medicines and do all these things. And so I told you I was a deserter in the Navy. And this is, I don't even know how many years I'm seven years sober now, but, um, I called my boss back in Washington and I said, yeah, my brother's dying and I want to stay here and take care of him. And this deserter, drunk, alcoholic, um, within 30 minutes had orders to stay here in California and take care of him. And that's the program because, um, you know, left to myself, I'm a deserter drunk or in jail, um, but that's, that's work in the program. So I get, he actually bought a house in Weldon, California, which is just north a little bit. And I would come down here and work a little bit and then go spend a week up there. And I hadn't really, when I got up there, I hadn't really been going to meetings and I knew that I was getting crazy. And so one day I left the house and I knew that I was going to go to a meeting that day. Somehow I was going to find a meeting. This was, there was no internet. Um, and I pulled off on the road and there was a mountain in front of me. I mean, it just sounds so corny, but I could go left or I could go right. And something told me to go left. And I went left and um, maybe a mile down the road on the left-hand side was a, a club, an AA club. Um, and you know, I pull in there, I go in, there's not a meeting going on, but the lady that was there could tell I was crazy. Um, and she said, promise me that you'll come back to a meeting tonight, you know? And just like Charlene didn't say no today when I asked her, not because I'm her boss, but because she, um, 
I didn't say no to her. I mean, I knew that I needed to go back, but I didn't say no because I, um, I'm ready to take suggestions still. And so I went to a meeting that night and I shared. And do you know, in that meeting, there was someone that worked for hospice. And there was someone that worked at the funeral home in town. And there was a nurse. And Alcoholics Anonymous got me through that because I couldn't have done it by myself. I didn't know that I needed all those things, but we are everywhere. Um, so I stayed with him till he died and the rest of my family flew in and, um, and I got back to Washington and, and I should have sat still for a little while. Right. But I didn't, you know, I wanted to, now that I can't drink, um, what else can I do that will make me feel better? Right. So I, I'm going to transfer and I'm going to get this new job and, you know, I'm going to do something, anything except for to feel about my brother, except for, you know, now that. I wasn't there for the brother that committed suicide, but now I could be there for this brother. And I was. So I take orders down to um, Norfolk on a ship, and and I wasn't ready to transfer. I was a mess. And I didn't drink, but, you know, I, I started sleeping with a bunch of people. You know, I want something that's going to make me feel better. I can't drink, um, and that doesn't work either. Um <laughs> does not work. Um, and then I had to, you know, do another four step and make amends to those people, um, in order to, to not be crazy. But, um, I left, uh, I don't know how much time I have, but I left the Tortuga. I deployed on that ship and I thank God, my higher power, that I didn't deploy when I was drinking. I don't even know what would have happened. Um, in these, some of these foreign countries with me drinking and blacking out and getting lost. And I just can't even imagine what would happen. But as a sober person, I had made chief by then. Um, I would go to meetings all over the world. I went to a meeting in a bomb shelter in Israel. Um, I went to meetings in Australia, you know, um, we're everywhere. I went to meetings in Spain. I didn't even understand what people were saying, but I understood you know, we all have the same story. Um, so I'm grateful that I, um, that I was able to, to go to meetings everywhere and I would take tokens and leave them at the meetings, you know, a fistful of tokens. Um, so I got 10 minutes. Um, just trying to think I'd like to, I mean, I, I've worked all the steps many times. I sponsor people. Um, I call my sponsor, um, go to meetings, do service work. Uh, I know that I have to give it away to keep it. Um, anyway, so eventually I, I made master chief and, um, I went to the Kitty Hawk in Japan and, I made senior chief there and then um, came back to Washington, D.C. and made master chief. And all of that is because, you know, I was sober now and I was going to meetings, not because I'm so great. It was just and, – and the program works everywhere, you know. My first uh, ship as the command master chief, it was uh, the USS Pearl Harbor, and I would put an AA sticker on the back of the computer monitor, you know, because it never worked – if I went to a meeting on the ship and people had to be at the meeting, you know, they couldn't not look at me what was on my collar. They couldn't just look at me as another alcoholic. Um, but if I put that sticker on the back of my monitor and then people would say, oh, are you a friend of Bill's? And then you knew, you know, that you had um, people that really wanted to get sober. And I ended up sponsoring a young sailor. And um, there was three of us and we would have meetings, you know, a couple times a week. And I knew that um, my anonymity was safe with them. Um, one, the night before we dropped off some Marines in Iraq, um, the Command Sergeant Major, the Marine Corps uh, detachment that was with us, he came in my office and he's like, oh, you're a friend of Bill's? It, he was a friend of Bill's also. And, and I had a camel token. <clears throat> and I gave him that camel token to carry into, um, at the time they were going into Baghdad, when they didn't come back on the ship with us, but when we pulled back into San Diego 
the sergeant major came back on the ship and gave me my coin back. He had carried that into Baghdad, <clears throat> which was a big deal, you know. Um, anyways, I left the Pearl Harbor and I went to be the command master for the Ronald Reagan. That's a big deal. <clears throat> there have been, I don't know why I'm, there have been, uh, four women command mass chiefs of aircraft carriers, and I was the second one, and that's because of this program, not because, not because I'm so special, but um, because I could be a worker among workers, and I could treat people the way that I wanted to be treated, and I worked the steps, um, and I left, uh, left the Ronald Reagan, and um, did a couple other tours, I mean, it was, so the Ronald Reagan, an aircraft carrier, is 5,000 people. And no matter where the command master chief goes, people get out of your way. Just It's just the way it is. I mean, I sound bigger in uniform than I look. But um, but I left the Ronald Reagan, and I went back to Washington, D.C., and I had a dream. And in this dream, I was arguing with this sailor because I went through a little bit of a depression because now I'm just the complaint department for the Navy instead of, you know, the command master chief of the world's largest warship. And I had this dream, and um, in this dream, I said to this sailor, don't you know who I am? Yeah, yeah. And that's what I did exactly. I woke up, and I laughed, and I said, thank you. You know, I knew that because of this program that I needed to leave that ship and get right-sized and be of service somewhere else. Uh, and my last duty station, I was the command mass chief at Balboa Hospital and um, Navy Medicine West, and like I said, I don't really know anything about medicine or medical, but um, I'll close with this last story. Um, but the the people in charge of walking across the bridge um, on Memorial Day at that time was the command master chief and the admiral at the hospital. So that was myself and the admiral I worked with. And I was freaking out a bit about walking across the Coronado Bridge. I had driven across it, but to walk across that bridge. Um, and so we're with the wounded warriors, and there's a Marine in a wheelchair, and he had just lost his leg in Iraq, and this arm was burnt. And he was trying to push himself in his wheelchair with one arm. And so I just said, you know, I'm going to give you an order that I'm going to, you know, help you. I'm going to push you across the bridge. And um, he said, uh, Mass Chief, I hate bridges. I'm like, yeah, I hate this bridge too. Um, and I said, but tell me your story. And so he told me the story about being in Iraq and having a pack on. And um, he stepped on, a, on an IED on a bridge and he got blown into the water. And that's how he lost his leg. And he's crying and I'm crying and everybody's just moving away from us. And, um, and I thought I was going to be safe, but he turned around and he said, so why do you hate bridges? And so I told this young Marine my story about my brother committing suicide and me getting in a fight with him. And, you know, I had gone through years of therapy and I had helped my other brother die. And, um, you know, it takes what it takes to heal. And, uh, and I got done telling my story and he turned around and he said, Master Chief, it wasn't your fault. And right then, um, I was healed again, just a little bit, like feeling like it wasn't my fault. But that's this program. I don't have moments like that in my life. Um, that's the 11th step. That's understanding the things that are happening are not because of me. They're because of my higher power. Um, and today, um, I still have a sponsor. Um, I, <laughs> Charlene and I met at a meeting, but she said, I'm looking for a job. I said, you got to talk to the manager because I don't, you know, I'm not good at it. But um, to see the growth in her has been amazing. Um, I'm just grateful every day to the program and uh, and grateful that you all let me come here and ramble on for the last 40 minutes. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.